morning. Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of Christ our Lord and welcome uh, to worship. It's a beautiful day to worship God together. We're so glad that you have joined us here uh, for this day. I uh, hope that you are planning to stay after worship uh, for fellowship, for food, and just a time of getting to know one another. Uh, I have heard that the slip and slide will surpass any records that have been set here at Francis Asbury. So after worship, we will just make our way outside and just enjoy time of fellowship uh, together. There are a number of announcements in your bulletin, uh, so hopefully you will read those and find out some opportunities coming up here at Francis Asbury. Uh, I do thank you for wearing your name tags this month so that I can match your names uh, and your faces and hopefully very soon just be able to look at every one of you and to call you by your name. So thank you for your patience. Thank you for your grace and your warm welcome here at Francis Asbury. One other announcement I want to highlight, and that's on the back of your bulletin. Uh, we got a call this week uh, from one of our area churches uh, regarding the Penny Center thrift shop. And there's going to be a conversation happening this week about uh, new leadership and the possibility of maybe a group of churches in the Hominy Valley taking leadership on there. So uh, there's an opportunity to go and to listen and to hear uh, dreams and ideas, and that's on Tuesday morning. So, uh, so let Daniel know if you're interested in being a part of that conversation and whatever we we hear and we glean, we'll bring back here to our church leadership and see what the future of that uh, ministry might be here in our community. Now, as we prepare our hearts and we enter a time of worship, uh, we will invite Cindy, who will come and lead us in our call to worship. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you this morning? Please respond in bold. It would be easy for us to say, fine, thank you. But the truth is that there are lots of things going on in our lives. Lots of time crunches and pressures. You have come to the right place. Rest for a minute. Take a deep breath and let it out slowly. Just relax and let your heart be open to God's word for you. That sounds good to us. Feel the healing, soothing power of God's love for you. Lord, we rest our minds, spirits, and hearts in your compassionate love. Amen. Before our opening again, I have a good authority. Tomorrow is Pastor Avery's birthday, so we need to say happy birthday to him.
these belong to the kingdom of heaven. We'll invite our children, our young disciples, to come down for a time of sharing with Carolyn. Good morning. Why don't you all come over just a little closer so all those people back there can see. Thank you. Now, the story we're going to hear today was first told over 2,000 years ago. Wow, that must be a good story. Well, we're going to hear it today. I want to ask you, at your home, has your mother ever planned a big dinner for people to come? Raise your hand. Yes. Sometimes, were they going to spend a few days at your home? Raise your hand. Yes, maybe grandmother and grandfather came. Okay. What did you do at your home to get ready for company? Raise your hand. Okay, what did you do? How about pick up your dirty clothes and put them in the basket? Does that work? Okay. How about picking up your toys, Jane? Do you ever help mother like that? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Enthusiastic about that. All right. I want to tell you a story today about two sisters that lived together. And their name was Martha and Mary. Okay. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus and his followers were coming down the trail to Jerusalem. And he saw Martha, the oldest sister, and she said, Oh, Jesus, why don't you come to my home and bring your followers and stay and have a meal with us? And if you need to stay at our home, you can stay. He said, Thank you, Martha. We'll be there. Now, Martha and Mary loved Jesus. So... What do you do before a uh, company comes? We clean the house. There's one other thing when you're going to feed somebody. You have to have food. Okay. 2,000 years ago, I'm going to the market and I'm going to buy some food. I'm going to get some grain and wheat and vegetables. Then I'm going to bring my basket back and then I'm going to probably prepare them to cook. Now, I clean the house, I've been cooking all day what I can, and all of a sudden, not, not Jesus and his disciples come. And I say, Mary, go tell the disciples and Jesus to come in, and she does. Now, Mary, did you finish dusting like I asked you to? Oh, I saw some things rather dusty in the living room, running dust before Jesus comes in, you know. That's the living room. That doesn't that look like a living room? And I will sweep the floor. He's not quite here yet, so we'll sweep the floor, we'll dust the furniture, and then we'll have him to come in and sit down. Thank you, Mary. And knock, knock. And Jesus comes in and he sits down with you all and he starts talking. Now, Jesus, it's so good to have you here and all of your friends. I'm going to the kitchen and finish cooking, okay? The meal will be ready shortly. Uh, Mary, are you coming? Oh, well. Got put my apron on here. I'm going to cook for 12 people plus. Okay. Now. In the stone oven, I just put two loaves of bread. And I'm stirring the rice and the other things. Oh my goodness. Oh, Mary didn't dust the plates off. We don't usually use this many plates. They're just two of us. Okay, I'm dusting the plates and I'm trying to hurry. Oh, I forgot my bread. Oh, I burnt one loaf. I'll have to put another one in. Mary, can you come in here and help me? Oh my goodness, I'm scared. Oh, Mary, why don't you come and help me? <laughs> Jesus, can you tell Mary to come in here and help me get your meal ready? And you know what? Mary doesn't move. She stays right at the foot of Jesus the whole time. 
no matter how much I yelled to her. Jesus, would you please send Mary in here to help me fix the meal? She's still not moving. And you know what Jesus said? He probably walked up to Martha and said, put his hand on her shoulder and said, Martha, you're worried about so many things. You're just in a tizzy. Mary is doing the right thing. What I'm telling my followers and my friends and Mary is important. And she has the right priority. You're trying to cook the food for everybody's body. And I'm telling Mary and the friends how to fix your soul. Now your soul in your heart is how you feel toward God. And he gives us opportunity to feed our souls. You know what you're doing right now, Wilson? You've come to children's time. You've come to Sunday school. And Jane, you've come to Sunday school and church. And you know what? You're feeding your soul right now. But after we finish in church, we're going to go feed our body. Do you know how you can fill your soul? How to feel good? Jesus taught us to say, if we're servants of other people, have you ever been in school and saw one little boy or girl eating at the table by herself at lunch? Have you? Have you? And, and sometimes you feel kind of sorry for them. What if, Lillian, you went up and sat down and said, may I sit with you today? How do you think that will make her feel? Very happy. And it makes you happy. That's the way you fill your soul, with things that serve others. Wilson, what if you had your lunch that day and you had two little uh, jello cats and the little boy across from you brings his lunch and you noticed he never had very much in his bag and you said to your friends, would you like one of my jellos? Why, yes, thank you, Wilson. And you know what? The little boy was feeding his body but you were feeding your soul. That means you were making yourself feel good. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do with us. So I want to tell you something, and I want you to listen with both ears. You may not remember a lot what's said up here at the children's time, but do you know I'm going to tell you something I want you to hear with both ears. Got both ears open? Jesus loves you very, very much much. And don't ever forget that. He says, I will always be with you. Always. And I will take care of you. And when you hurt, somebody hurts your feelings or you're not feeling well, Jesus said, people, my Father will take care of you forever. Now, as we remember what God said, You've had days that people have hurt your feelings, right? Let's think about our soul. God says, I will be with you. Can you feel better knowing that God's with you and that he's going to help you? Always remember that. Martha, we don't know whether she went to the living room and sat down with the disciples or not. But probably they came in to help her after all of that complaining about not having help. But today, I want you to remember that we need to fill our soul and heart as much as we fill our body. Will your car run with no fuel? No. Can you get in touch with God if you're not listening or asking God to come into your heart? No. The last thing you do when you lay your head on your pillow tonight, will you think of one thing that he blessed you with today. One good thing that happened to you. Let's pray. For these children, oh God, we're thankful for the opportunity to bring them to you and to share with you what you all need to hear, that our soul needs to be led. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let us now lift our hearts in prayer. Each week, Daniel sends us out a list with those that we are in prayer for and with. We lift up our joys and concerns uh, together. We have a number of uh, folks in our church and our community for whom we are in prayer today. Folks who are uh, recovering, family members who are on our hearts today, who are dealing with illness. Uh, we lift up the grantees, as you saw. Uh, Dick is anticipating a surgery tomorrow. We lift up Dick and Carol. Uh, you might have other names circumstances that are on your heart and on your mind today that you want to lift up to God. So let us have a moment of silence where you can offer your prayers of thanksgiving and concern to God, and I will offer prayer for us together. Let us pray. God of love, today we rest in your presence. You always invite us into your deep and abiding grace. You hope, God, that we in turn invite you in, into our hearts, into our lives, into our present, and into our future. Just like those who've gone before us, like Mary, like Martha, we are still working on expressing our faith and our discipleship in inward and outward ways so that we can fully love you and fully love our neighbors. God, we admit today there are worries on our minds. There are distractions in our path. Some days we, like Martha, feel like everything is resting on our shoulders. But right now, in this moment of worship, we seek you, only you. We seek your presence and we trust that you were already here and that you remain with us always. God, we seek your peace, that peace that passes all understanding. We ask you give us courage to release that that we need to let go of today so that we can recommit ourselves to what is most important. God, we thank you for those who lead, those who have walked beside us. We thank you for our teachers, for our family, for our friends, for mentors who have taught us what it means to sit at your feet. And as we pray, we remember our neighbors near and far who are in need. We lift up those who hurt and who struggle, who worry and who are afraid, those whose basic needs will not be met today. And we pray that even in small ways, we can be reflections of your hope and your light wherever we go. We pray your Holy Spirit will abide in every broken heart, in every place of struggle. God, lead us forward, for we are looking for signs of your heavenly kingdom coming here upon the earth. We pray in the name of Jesus, who is our risen Lord, and we join our voices together in the prayer he has taught us, saying, <coughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we worship God through song and through prayer and through scripture, one of the ways that we worship God is giving an offering, giving our tithes, our gifts, which is returning to God what God has first given to us. We ask that God will receive the gifts that we give, will bless them, and then we'll send them out into the world uh, to do God's work. Please stand and join the singing, We Are Offering.
Our gospel reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke in the 10th chapter, verses 38 through 42. Let us hear the word of God. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part which will not be taken away from her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. One night, a woman invited some people over for dinner. As they took their seats around the table, she asked her six-year-old daughter, would you like to say the blessing for us tonight? Well, I wouldn't know what to say, uh, the little girl said. Well, it's okay, said her mother. Just say what you have heard mommy say. <laughs> oh, okay, said the little girl. So she clasped her hands, and she bowed her head, and she prayed, Dear Lord, why did I invite all of these people over for dinner? <laughs> Sometimes, hosting company can make us a little bit nervous. Maybe that's what happened to Martha. After all, if Jesus showed up at your house, what would you do? Would you invite him inside? Would you offer him the most comfortable recliner? Would you cut some fresh flowers out of the garden and put them on the table? Would you say, uh, hold on just a second, Jesus, stand on the front porch and you sweep some stuff under the bed before you let him come inside? It's not a stretch for us to imagine the pressure and the responsibility that Martha felt in this situation. First of all, it was her goal in that culture and at that time uh, to be the host, to take on these responsibilities like cooking, like serving, like welcoming people to her home. And second of all, there is no more honored guest than Jesus himself. And there he was, sitting in her living room. Luke gives us this story just after the parable of the Good Samaritan, which we heard last week. He tells us Jesus and his companions are continuing on their journey towards Jerusalem. And on their way, they come to a certain village, and they stop at Martha's house where they are welcomed inside. And Martha immediately starts doing all the things that she knows are important, all the things that are expected of her. And her sister Mary, on the other hand, uh, as we saw from the children's time, she bucks social protocol and she sits at the feet of Jesus. She listens to his teaching and hangs on his every word and she sucks it up like she's a sponge. And she takes the posture of a disciple. But after a little while, there's a little sibling conflict, isn't there? Martha gets a little upset that she's the one, the only one, who's running around and preparing dinner. Jesus, don't you care? Don't you care that Mary isn't doing her part? Don't you care that I'm in here all alone? Tell her to help me, Jesus. Yikes. But Jesus is so wise. And Jesus already knows the hearts of both sisters. He responds with her name, Martha, Martha. And sometimes when we read the gospel, we hear echoes of the Brady Bunch here, right? You're thinking, Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. <laughs> but this is a different tone. When I picture this scene, Jesus, he's calm. He doesn't raise his voice. And he looks right at Martha with understanding and patience and love. Martha, Martha, you are so worried and distracted by so many things. 
And all of this is keeping you from, from the best thing, the most important thing. Your sister, Mary, she's already chosen it. So slow down, Martha. Breathe, Martha. Don't let your worries and your anxieties and even your frustrations take away from your purpose and your calling and your peace. How I wish that Luke told us how this story ended. What happened with Mary and Martha? Did Martha slow down and did she come join Mary and sit at the feet of Jesus? Did Mary offer to wash the dishes after dinner was over? What else did Jesus say while he was sitting in their home and he was teaching? What did they hear from him? So often the gospel writers sort of leave us to, to wonder and to interpret. I find myself saying, I wonder when I read the scriptures. <laughs> I wonder, did the rich young ruler actually sell all of his possessions and, and give the money away? I wonder, what happened to that Samaritan woman after she encountered Jesus at the well? What's the rest of her story? <laughs> I wonder, what happened with Mary and Martha at this dinner gathering, but we don't always get to know. We're asked to, to receive and to interpret and apply the scriptures as best we can so that then we can faithfully serve with our prayers and our presence and our gifts and our service and our witness. About 300 years ago, there was a man named Nicholas who lived in France, and when he was young, he was only 18 years old, and he was serving in the military, he had this conversion experience. It was winter time and he looked around and he noticed this tree nearby and it had lost all of its leaves as trees do in the winter. And as he looked at that tree, he realized that well before long, the leaves and the flowers would return and they would appear again. And he says in that moment, sort of looking at this tree, he saw clearly the providence and the power of God. And Suddenly his heart, Wesley might say, his heart was strangely warmed. Um, it sparked in him this great love for God, so much so that after his military service, Nicholas became a monk, and he joined a monastery. He became known as Brother Lawrence. And in the monastery, Brother Lawrence's job was working in the kitchen. He would say this was where he found his greatest joy and his greatest spiritual growth, cooking and washing the dishes. As part of their life together, Brother Lawrence and all the other monks, they would participate in these daily rhythms of prayer seven times every day for a total of three hours in prayer. But Brother Lawrence would say the most powerful times for him were in the kitchen. That's when he could most authentically pray. He could praise God. He could practice the presence of God, as he called it. And living in the monastery, there were plenty of other people. There were ordained clergy, but it was Brother Lawrence that people would come to. They would seek out his advice and his counsel. And after he died, someone took his letters and his writings and even uh, things that he had said, and they compiled them into a book. Although Brother Lawrence was pretty humble, so I wonder what he would think about someone compiling all of that. But the book is called Practicing the Presence of God. And it's a small little book, but for hundreds of years, this has been a, a classic in, in theology and spirituality because it's so rich. And I still have a few boxes of books to unpack, but once I finish, I'll be glad to loan out my copy of Practicing the Presence of God. In his book, Brother Lawrence says every day he, he cooked and he cleaned, and as he was doing all of that, he tried to develop this awareness of God with him until it just became second nature. He said the presence of God is our spirit in contact with God. And his goal was just to become holy gods with everything about him. He said he would start by, by giving himself to God, loving God with all that he had, and asking for forgiveness where he needed to be forgiven. He said he tried to worship God as much as possible, although even Brother Lawrence admitted sometimes his mind would start to wonder in worship or in prayer, and he would, he would call it back, and he would start over again 
and again and again. And so he, he repeated all of these practices over and over again until they just became his way of living. Practicing the presence of God. How do you do that? How do you practice the presence of God? Is it praying? Participating in worship? Is it being part of a small group? Maybe for you, like Brother Lawrence, it's, it's in the kitchen, uh, peeling potatoes and baking bread. Maybe it's singing. Maybe it's folding clothes at ABCCM. Maybe it's getting up first thing in the morning before the sun's even up and finding your cup of coffee and having that devotion time before you start the day. Maybe it's uh, on the river, on the trail, here in the mountains. The where, the how, it's not really the most important part. It's the consistency. It's making it a priority. John Wesley founded our Methodist movement. He used to get up at 3 a.m. every day so that he could pray and he could journal and practice the presence of God. And his most important part of theology was grace. And John Wesley taught God's grace is given to all of us. We don't earn it or deserve it, but God gives it to us. And Wesley would say, we get to participate. Instead of sitting back and watching, we get to be active and participate in what God is doing. He'd say there's some specific ways that we do that. He called them means of grace. He divided them into two categories. One was works of piety and one was works of mercy. The works of piety, that's the Mary sort of category. Things like reading and studying the Bible, prayer, attending worship, sharing Holy Communion. The works of mercy are more of a Martha kind of a category. Doing good works, visiting people sick or in prison, feeding the hungry, giving generously to help other people, working for justice. And John Wesley would say, well, we, we really need both uh, as people of faith. But most of all, we should be intentional with open hearts and open minds and willing spirits. So we ask ourselves, like Mary and like Martha, what is most important? What is our first priority? What is, as Jesus said, what is the better thing? The author Kathleen Norris says, we want to have meaning, we want fulfillment, we want joy and healing. But the human paradox is we find these things by starting where we are, not where we wish we were. She says we look for our blessings to come from unlikely, everyday places. We can relate to the story of Mary and Martha because we understand the pull between the two. I probably hear more from people that they lean more towards Martha uh, perspective. We have worries and anxieties, don't we? We have concerns that keep us up at night and weigh on our minds. We have responsibilities that maybe weigh us down a little bit, make us feel uh, heavy. It's not easy for us to just stop and to be still and to focus on practicing the presence of God. It's something that we, we work at. Not to mention there's a lot in the world around us that can be distracting, right? We have, we have news 24-7. We have events of the world that, that swirl around us. And we have um, technology and screens. We're very rarely unplugged. A few years ago, a, a columnist from the New York Times talked about this taxi ride that he took on the way to the airport. And he said on that uh, not a very long ride, he said he and the taxi driver, they did six things. He said the driver drove, and he talked on his cell phone, and he watched a video. And he said Friedman, the passenger, worked on his laptop, and he listened to his iPod, and he rode in the car. The only thing we didn't do, he said, was talk to each other. <laughs> the disease of our connected age, he says, is continuous partial attention. We're so busy with, with emailing and with, with texting and with technology, sometimes we're not paying attention to what's happening with and to the people around us. <laughs> You're worried and distracted by many things, Jesus said. Remember the best thing. Stop. 
Be still. Breathe. Sit at my feet. Listen with your ears and with your heart and with your mind and come back and find your center in me. Years ago, I spent some time in another country studying and learning at a Methodist church there. And one of my mentors would advise me. He said, Avery, you should really work to have praying eyes. And he would spell it just to clarify, P-R-A-Y-I-N-G, eyes. Have praying eyes. He said, when you look around the, at the, the world around you, everything you see, every person you see, you should be praying. Praying for them, over them. It was this great spiritual practice, but it takes some work to make it second nature, kind of like Brother Lawrence, wherever you are, whatever you perceive with your eyes, to be in prayer. The more you do it, the more natural it becomes. Some, some things are easy, like if you get up and you see a sunrise and the sky is just blazing orange. If you listen to talented musicians who are lifting up their gifts, if you cradle a new baby, in your arms. If you feel a friend or a loved one that is taking your hand, somehow you're in prayer and you notice you're in the presence of Jesus. Eventually, as you practice and you work at it, that turns into prayer while you're sitting in the, in the waiting room at the doctor's office or while you're sitting in the carpal line uh, waiting for your turn or, or at food line or Maybe even in a traffic jam on 240. For 2,000 years, Christians have uh, practiced the presence of God. Martha reminds us every day, our tasks are where we encounter God. We could be at home. We could be on the road. We could be doing chores. We could be serving other people. We could be experiencing even the shadow of the valley of death. She reminds us to keep seeking God's heart so we don't miss what's important. The story of Mary and Martha isn't a story that asks us to choose. We don't choose just like Jesus does it between two sisters, either or. We don't choose between acts of service or private spiritual practices works of piety or works of mercy. It's a story that invites us to practice the presence of God. And there's no limit to the number of ways we can do that. It's a story that invites us to learn from Mary and Martha, imagining what it might have been like to host them in our home, to literally sit at his feet, to imagine experiencing his presence with us now. I love the way that Elizabeth Bolton says it. She says, this isn't a story that celebrates study or inaction or sitting still. It's a story of savoring, delighting in God, creating the possibility of Sabbath on even our busiest day. By the same token, it's, it's not a critique of kitchen duty or the active life or just plain old getting things done. It's a critique of worry and distraction. A critique of being fragmented or chasing after so many things when there's just one thing. After all, God who created juicy watermelon and sweet corn on the cob, the God who let down manna from heaven, the God who even after death had a fish fry on the beach, this is the God of, of grand dinner parties and soup kitchens and snacks and family meals. God is not against cooking or hosting or menial tasks. So she says, if study is your thing, by all means, sit at the feet of the great teacher. If caring through cooking is your thing or cleaning up or serving the poor or getting things done, then do the same. For the risen Christ is everywhere. So delight in him. Savor him. Choose the better part and practice His presence. As we practice the presence of God, I'm reminded of the words of the psalmist. How lovely is your dwelling place, O God. My soul yearns and even faints to be in your courts. My heart, my whole body sings for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home at your altars wherever they may be. 
even the spirit finds a home at your altars. So do we. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 